Hello, and welcome to Pioneers in Medicine. I'm Bruce Gewertz, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Surgeon-in-Chief, and today it is our great uh, good fortune to have Kenneth Kim, who has joined us as Chief of Gynecologic Oncology. And Ken has a, a tremendous background, which we'll review, and he brings a, a very needed skill set here to Southern California. Ken, welcome. Thanks. Really glad to be here. Very honored. Well, tell us a little bit about your background. Where were you born? And and uh, I know your folk, your dad was a physician, but tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a third generation physician. So I grew up with medicine. I grew up going to the operating room. I would grow up cutting steak and my grandfather and my father would judge me and critique me on how I was cutting the steak along the fascial planes. And here's this structure and that structure. Uh, but I was born in Pennsylvania. I was born where Yingling is brewed in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Grew up there for a few years, and then we moved to Hawaii uh, and spent some formative years in Hawaii. Uh, and then I went to boarding school in New Hampshire, college in Philadelphia, and then med school residency. I trained at the Ohio State, uh, followed by fellowship at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. I got recruited to UNC. I needed a basketball team. <laughs> got recruited back to Alabama, and then finally got recruited here to join all these fine people and you here. Oh, terrific. So I, I know that gynecologic oncology is a very uh, challenging uh, field, and I wondered if you could tell us how you spend most of your time. What type of problems do you take care of and procedures do you perform? Yeah, so G1 oncology is um, actually a very unique, special field. We're, we're the only cancer field that does all of the radical surgery uh, within the abdominal pelvic cavity and we do all of our own chemotherapy. So we're really trained as surgical oncologists as well as medical oncologists, which is really unique for us. We see our patients from the time they get diagnosed through their disease course uh, until they're cured or they die of disease. Uh, so we have a really unique continuity of care with our cancer patients. Uh, the most common things that we see are patients with ovary cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, and then some other rare cancers, vulvar vaginal cancer, as well as uh, gestational neoblastic tumors um, that happen following gestational events. Um, so those are the, the, the primary things that we see, and we manage their surgeries as well as their, their adjuvant therapies. You know, so I, I know that, that the, the diagnosis of these cancers is complicated. Uh, we all know that ovarian uh, tumors occur in the body and, and rarely show signs until they're somewhat advanced. In contradistinction, uh, cervical cancers uh, can be diagnosed, or at least uh, reasonably so, with regular uh, pap smears. What are the barriers uh, to diagnosis of these cancers? Yeah, ovary cancer is uh, particularly difficult. Um, it, it's a curious dichotomy between cervical cancer and ovary cancer. Uh, ovaries are just kind of flapping in the breeze in the middle of the peritoneal cavity in the belly. So when they start getting enlarged, um, there's a lot of space in there. So they can get quite large before the patient really knows uh, that anything is going on. And then the symptoms they might experience um, this is going to probably sound weird, but I tell my patients it's really a lot of symptoms that happen after you eat kind of the fourth meal after midnight. Uh, it's bloating, nausea, vomiting, changes in bowel habits, uh, early satiety, things like that. But those are things that a lot of people experience from day to day, uh, time to time. So when, when it happens, uh, it's pretty insidious. It's what they call the whispering disease. And all of a sudden it's stage three or stage four when, they, when it gets diagnosed. Um, every screening technology and, and uh, algorithm that we've, tr that we've tried has not really made any impact towards finding it at an earlier stage. Uh, if anything, in some studies, when we try to screen for it, it increases complications. So it's, it's a fight that we keep on finding, trying to find a test or a way to find these women uh, with earlier stage to make an impact uh, uh, and improve the survival, um, especially with some of the newer technologies coming out now. So the, uh, are there genetic predispositions to ovarian cancer that can give you a, a higher index of suspicion? Absolutely. Um, uh, certainly probably one of the more famous ones is being BRCA positive uh, breast and ovary cancer uh, are certainly increased. 
Um, and here at Cedar sinai we're actually in the process, uh, in conjunction with our cancer center here, building a BRCA center um, that will be really multidisciplinary, comprehensive with uh, the breast team, our team, um, imaging and genetics and the like. There's also other lesser common genetic syndromes that increase your risk for ovary cancer. Uh, and here especially, we have um, a really excellent program, one of the uh, highest volumes in the country and certainly the highest in the state of California where uh, they come in, they get plugged in, they get all of their genetic testing, all of their screening um, for finding not just the standard therapies, but other therapies that could improve their survival. And I sense that referring to ovarian cancer that that there is as of yet no reliable serum based biomarker. Yeah, that's correct. Serum based testing hasn't really panned out. Um, uh, we've tried serum-based testing in conjunction with imaging, and that also hasn't panned out. Uh, but we're still continuing to do research to try to find something that'll work. Now, uh, when women uh, need hysterectomies for uh, fibroid disease or or uh, post uh, uh, menstrual bleeding or uh, post menses bleeding, I guess, uh, what are what are the things you go through to decide whether it's prudent or not to remove the ovaries at the same time? Yeah, the ovaries, um, interestingly, have even some function after menopause. Uh, obviously, their primary hormonal production goes down drastically after menopause, but there are certain benefits afterwards um, that are still there. Uh, interestingly, over the last probably five or 10 years, we've now discovered, especially when we do risk reducing surgeries for the BRCA patients, we've found that, um, you know, 40 to 60% of these patients, uh, their cancers actually started in the fallopian tube uh, rather than the ovary. So it's really changed the uh, entire perception of this disease, knowing that a lot of them actually start in the tube. And so now when we do hysterectomies for whatever reason, a lot of times it is an opportunity to take out the tubes while leaving the ovaries that will still um, retain their hormonal function, but will reduce their risk of quote unquote ovary cancer, which actually many times starts in the fallopian tube. So if uh, just as a hypothetical, if I'm a woman and my mother or sister had ovarian cancer, would it be prudent even in the absence of BRCA or any other Lynch or other genetic predisposition to consider having a what we call prophylactic oophorectomy? Yeah, certainly. Um, if we were to see that patient, they would get genetic counseling and genetic testing because there's many, many other genes that act like BRCA that are technically not BRCA. Uh, and we have gene panels now that test upwards of a few hundred genes. Um, so with that and with the family history, uh, it could be prudent to take out the tubes and ovaries, but we would certainly uh, do uh, comprehensive genetic testing and, and counseling uh, to weigh the risks and the benefits and individualize it for the woman. So, so the, the other uh, very common cancer, uh, one of them, of course, is cervical cancer. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the changes in treatment and surveillance for cervical cancer. Absolutely. Uh, I just came from Alabama, where it's one of the highest uh, incidences of cervical cancer in the country um, and an institution where my partner uh, writes all the screening guidelines for cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is... is uh, uh, because of the location of the cervix being a little bit more accessible uh, is more amenable to pap smears, uh, to finding uh, not even early stage cancer, but a precancer that we can treat long before it becomes cancer. Uh, so that, and especially now with uh, HPV vaccination, we're able to prevent upwards of 90% of uh, cervical cancers with the current HPV vaccine that's available. And uh, how uh, we talked about this in a previous uh, podcast with uh, Alan Ho for head and neck cancer. How successful have we been overall in getting uh, young adults uh, vaccinated? So we're not as good as other countries, um, but the rate is improving. And even in the last couple years uh, for HPV vaccination, uh, we've been slowly increasing, but it's not near where it needs to be. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of education that needs to be done, not just to patients, but also to the uh, primary care providers and the people who are uh, kind of on the front line that, that perform the majority of vaccinations for, you know, the population that we have. 
And what's the best age to vaccinate males and females for HPV? So originally, um, vaccinating them prior to an ex exposure. So the initial age uh, that it was approved for in the very beginning was starting at age nine through 26. But now it's expanded um, uh, to include uh, uh, a larger range into adulthood uh, and even after exposure. There's now we're having more emerging data on after exposure uh, um, and vaccinating those individuals. But probably the best time is still when they're younger, giving them the vaccine before any exposure to prevent any sort of issues, uh, whether it be cervical cancer or uh, genital warts, um, and can also have an effect on other HPV related diseases like uh, uh, rectal and anal cancers, head and neck cancers, and things like that. So the other uh, very large uh, area that I know you care for is uterine cancer. And uh, what, what has changed in terms of the diagnosis and treatment of that? So uterine cancer um, is the most common GYN cancer in this country. Uh, the primary risk factor is obesity and God bless America. There's plenty of that in this country. Um, the, the biggest things that have happened in, in uterine cancer in the last probably five to 10 years is that the vast majority of these surgeries are now able to be done minimally invasively uh, with sentinel node identification rather than dissecting the full set of nodes um, which can minimize complications and morbidity. And aside from that, the upfront surgery, uh, the adjuvant treatment and the available immunotherapies and other targeted therapies, uh, much like over cancer, have really exploded and are continuing to evolve and emerge, uh, which is huge. So, so uh, this I probably should have asked you at the very beginning, but what is the most common manifestation of uterine cancer? So uterine cancer, there's a couple different kinds of uterine cancer. Uh, the most common being just endometrial cancer, the cancer of the lining of the uterus. And luckily we're able to find the majority of those cancers at an early stage, usually stage one. Those patients experience a um, postmenopausal bleeding event and usually they're good about going to the hospital or going to their physician to get it checked out uh, early on. Uh, they get a biopsy done and then endometrial cancer is found, but typically it's stage one. So it's, it's a very common disease, but luckily, uh, you know, 80% or so, uh, maybe more are stage one when we find it highly curable. Typically, so very different than ovarian cancer. Yes, uh, definitely because of the, the the early symptom and and they they know that something's wrong and they come right in to, to get seen. Typically, so overall, and I know we're lumping uh, the three main cancers together, and we didn't get a chance to talk about vulvar lesions. Uh, what is going on with number one, the overall incidence of gynecologic tumors, and number two, the survival? So. Uh, interestingly, uh, uterine cancer incidence is going up a little bit. Um, and I think over, I just looked at this yesterday, over the last probably 10 years, cervical cancer incidence is also creeping up a little bit as well. So it's, it's overall uh, kind of increasing. Um, the survival for uh, cervical cancer is kind of interesting to think about because now we're in the age uh, of, of the HPV vaccination uh, of kind of the first um, set of women that were girls when they got it, uh, uh, preventing the disease. So the incidence um, is going down. But the problem in this country is the people often who are at the highest risk of cervical cancer are the patients without access or without care and don't get pap smears and don't get HPV vaccination. So there's some work to be done uh, to impact that survival and finding the populations that are at risk for that. Um, uterine ovary cancer are are the survival, especially in the last couple of years for ovary cancer with the, the advent of PARP inhibitors has really made a huge uh, difference in overall survival for patients with uh, epithelial ovarian cancer. Um, so we're, we're making some headway in survival uh, and, and treatments, um, um, which hopefully will continue to go in the right way. So I, you know, I've been, uh, it's been my good fortune to meet your wife and I know she's a distinguished uh, gynecologic uh, uh, and an obstetrician as well. Uh, what are the particular challenges that you have? Because I know you have a family and the, both of you work pretty hard. And how, how, how have you uh, reconciled that? We, yes, it's, it's uh, contending with uh, two fairly busy call schedules and clinic schedules. Um, we have a really good nanny and actually coming here, being closer to my parents at least, um, we have some additional help. We've actually never lived near family 
uh, until we moved here. So that's an added bonus. But we have a very good uh, flexible nanny that's able to um, uh, take care of things when either both of us are on call or we're both stuck in surgeries or at the hospital taking care of patients or teaching residents uh, as it is with medical careers. So can you prognosticate there's going to be a fourth generation of physicians in your family? How do your kids feel about well, it? Well, I don't know. There, there could be. They're, they're, they're only nine. I have twins. They're only nine. And they're, there's definitely promise. They're, they seem pretty bright. Uh, they swing a golf club pretty well. Uh, so hopefully they'll do something productive because someone's got to take care of us when we're old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a long way to go based on my assessment. <laughs> yeah. Listen, Ken, it's been great to have a chance to talk to you. We're delighted you're here at Cedar sinai and we'll look forward to connecting again. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really glad to be here. Glad I could talk with you, hang out again.